Join us as we celebrate 150 years of African American history in Champaign, next on Illinois Pioneers. There's been a vibrant African-American community in Champaign for the city's entire history. As Illinois Pioneers continues its celebration of Champaign's 150th year, we examine the African-American history from a unique perspective. We welcome two members of one of Champaign's oldest and best documented families, Estella Merrifield and her sister, Hester Suggs. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. From where did your family migrate to Champaign? Well, some came from Tennessee. Some came from to Champaign from Homer. One section came from Tennessee to Homer, and then to Champ on um, the Champaign, and another section came from uh, North Carolina. Is it North Carolina? Yeah, and then uh, some of them came from where here. I, I'm not exactly sure. Sure. Others about, came in later, but about when was that? About 1865, 1864. Let's take a look at a, a map here on the screen and uh, give us some idea of where the family came from. And uh, there we have the, the areas of the country where they came from. And in the next picture, you mentioned this already, that uh, some of your uh, ancestors stayed in, in Homer. And that's actually a picture of Homer Park. Yes, that is Homer Park. And my mother was of uh, William Frank Ernest. The Ernest family was in Homer. and the. Uh, Frank Ernest's uh, uncle Frank, he was named for one of you know the older, but uh, they moved from Homer to Champaign because of the fact that mother wanted them to go to university and Homer only went to the second year uh -huh. of yeah. high school, and so they moved to Champaign so they could finish. And then Uncle Frank went on to um, uh, University of Illinois, and then. Of course, mother, she graduated from high school here. And, and my sister, Hester, you have something to say to that? <laughs> well, you know, they just, um, Frank needed to go to the University of mm -hmm. Illinois. And in fact, he was uh, killed while he was, one of the, the pillars at Memorial Stadium has his name on it because he was one of those that, um, I yeah, was scared of the First World War. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the history of your family in public service and in the military as we go along because that's very interesting. Let's look at the next uh, image that we have here for us. That's actually a picture of, that's uh, <laughs> of, of Estella. <laughs> and uh, and then we'll switch to the next one. Yeah. The, that is a Hester picture of, Jean of Hester. Uh -huh. oh, thank you. So we want people to recognize you from, from your time in history. Let's look at the next image from, uh, that we have here, one of the earliest of the uh, African-American settlers in Champaign. It was a man by the name of Roy Gillespie. Yes, he was part of our family. He was married to my aunt. And they and he, lived in Homer, and the then, Gillespie family. So they were in Homer as well? Yes, the original ones were. And the next image we have goes to that history that your family has with the military. This is a gentleman by the name of Jordan Anderson. Well, Jordan Anderson, they, they, they first lived in Anderson, Indiana, and then they came on to, but that's my great-great-grandfather and great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, and the connections are, I don't know, I don't know whether he was the one that was in the war. It was uh, her second husband, his wife's, after he died, she married uh, George Popin's uh, great uncle. <laughs> he he was in the Civil War. So this is a Civil War image. Let's move to the next image that we have. That's of the 369th Division, out of Danville in World War One. And and Hester, right. what can you tell us about this? Well, my dad uh, was in that particular. Thing that was Cecil Nelson, and also uh, Frank Ernest, and I'm not sure exactly. You know, I can't really exactly see which one was him at this particular time, but I also have a um, picture that shows the barracks, 
and it, I used it many different times with school children because we could tell when we were looking at the different kinds of, um, of conditions that were there, we saw people who, Negroes in that particular time, who had cars and horse and buggy, and dad had, um, it was, it's all rolled up at this particular time because that's the way that they kept the p portraits at um, that time. I think some of us have the impression that, that uh, blacks at that time in World War I, uh, it was not a fully integrated military, of course, but it, that they had jobs in the supply line. Uh, 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 but this was a fighting unit. That it, was a it, fighting It suffered unit. casualties. Right. This, it was a unit that was connected with the French units when they got overseas. They went in with the French. And that uh, every, just about, Eight or ten of them on there had the curly gear for, you know, uh, they were honored in battle. And, and, and there were uh, fatalities. Yes, and Uncle Frank, that's William Frank Ernest, we, I have a picture of him, I didn't give it to you. But anyway, he, he uh, was killed overseas and Dad was with them at the time. And that's where we get the William F. Ernest Post from. This Dr. L. P. DeFay and Dr. Ellis, their their pictures are on there. I can't, well, I can't point let, them let's out. Let's go exactly. to the, the next image because you yeah. mentioned the post, the American Legion post. Now that, that that's my father in the center. And he was county commander. He, yeah, he was a county commander then. Now, and uh, the American Legion post has been a significant part of the social fabric of the African American community right, in Champaign right. for a long time. Mm -hmm. A long time. Ever since about, well, I think they formed about 1932, 33, somewhere when they first, that was later, because most of them, when they came back, they had to go to work to support their families mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, and the fellow here on the end is Alvin Foxwell. Yeah, that's Alvin Foxwell, and let's see who else is on. That, that's the county group there, that particular picture is the county group of the, of the American Legion. And if you notice, the. My dad has a copy of the Croix de Gear yeah, the, on his The purple uh, helmet. hearts on one right. side, the Croix de Gears up on the top, and the he had he was the most decorated man in in the uh, at the Champaign County. He, I think it's I don't know how many had mm -hmm. they used to have the decorations up. I still have the Croix de Gear. It was very interesting when the Ku Klux Klan burned a uh, cross on our front yard. My dad said. They could walk out there in the street all that they wanted to because that was public property. But he had his sharpshooting medal and we had the papers <laughs> for with it. And so he was a he was was a very forceful he was individual. Not to you know, be toyed with. You're no, right to be toyed, to be toyed with, with. You know, that he mm -mm. he knew his rights and he he studied the blue book, you know, the Illinois old Illinois blue book that had all the laws on it. And and he was very patriotic. Mm -hmm. But he was also, he, uh, was he had responsibility as well as um, the, a, an idea for recourse to some of the things. And that really helped us kids all the way along because he was such a strong individual. Well, the, the next image also goes to the history that your family has of, of public service. In the, describe this for us. Well, that's the, uh, <coughs> that's the uh, uh, Sheriff's Department, Champaign County Sheriff's Department, and that's about uh, around 1989, no, no, about 19, just about the turn of the century. Oh, okay. But that's my grandfather uh, on the first row there and next to the one in the end, the one with the, the mustache. Dog. He's on mm -hmm. the right side of that's the That's Grandpa Ernest. Uh, um, he's my grandfather. So and, uh, even back around 1900. Yeah, it, 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 that's uh, uh, what, what Nelson, Joe Nelson, Joseph Nelson. And he had grocery store after after he retired from that. He opened his own stores on North Fifth Street. And no, North, North Hickory. North Hickory Street. So right. he was the first black on he the sheriff's department? He was the only department. black on the sheriff's department. And, but uh, if you look at him, you can see how, how they made him a sheriff you know, just by his complexion and the way he sort of fit in with the whole he, group. He, he, he didn't cause any problems. <laughs> Half the people didn't know that he was black. Mm -hmm. The uh, next image helps us kind of define where 
some of the neighborhoods where there was no one African American neighborhood no, historically. There, wasn't. Mm -hmm. there were several. There's one on South, uh, oh, I guess South Ells Avenue. Ells Avenue, yes, in that area that's in South Champaign. Then there was one on uh, Western Champaign. Oh, what we called Plum Nelly, <laughs> but it it was a uh, Anthony Jones, a boxer. His folks all they lived out there, and the, the Pope family lived out there. Then there was another group that lived where we lived. Well, there was a very small enclave there on Church Street, and it was uh, it had about five or six families, and poor boys. That area around uh, where Columbia Street comes into Market Street. That was there, uh, and then as you go north, of, most of them lived north of the tracks and uh, north of the Big Four tracks and east of the Illinois Central. But there was also a group there and that there lived along Stoughton Avenue, um, the Wellses and the Watsons. Right. And on. Um, but that's in Urbana. In well, no, we had the Watsons and, and uh, Doc Claire Smith. Well, there's quite a few in there. Mm -hmm. There was a whole, an enclave across Wright Street there. People moved into that area, too. What, what tied those neighborhoods together? Our churches, the churches. Uh, there were several churches, but all of them more or less worked together. And they would, we would have uh, groups singing, groups would go from one church to the next church to the next church. And we knew all of the ministers, and there was Salem on Park Street corner, and then there was the AME churches on the on Park and we were on Park and uh, Fourth. Fourth, and Fifth Park and Fifth was the Salem church, and then up north, up in this area up in here, there was Mount Olive, was up, up north on Fourth Street, way north, and then there was uh, Pilgrim Church was down near the Oak, Oak Ash Division, that they call it now. There was Pilgrim there. And then, of course, Free Will was right across over in Urbana. Well, let's but, take uh, a, a look at the next image, because that, that helps us discuss the churches a little bit. This is... This is Bethel AME Church. That's back around, right after the turn of the century. That's back around the early 1900s. And they had their own band. And Irma Scott's father was our director, and Cecil Pope's father was the organist. Well, uh, later on, and these boys went. To, most of them belonged to Baraka Club, like Irma probably told you. And they, most of them went to University of Illinois. A lot of them went to University, and these are the people that lived around there. And the the next image uh, is a painting of that AME church. Yeah, that's how the church looked. This one was built in 1900. And this is where the AME church is today. They took that down. Now that painting was done by my brother, Cecil Nelson. He was a bronze tablet winner at the University of Illinois. He went on, became a famous artist. But uh, he did this when he was 15 years old. And that's how the church looked before without those people sitting in front of it. Take a look at the next image, which is uh, another of the churches, the uh, the Salem Baptist That's Church. That's Salem Baptist Church, and it was built about the same time. Uh, they all began in 18, well, let's see, we were 146 years, two years ago. Oh, my. And Salem's 142 years, mm -hmm. 143 years. And they used to argue who was the first church built. <laughs> but they didn't have this front on it at this time. They built, they, they remodeled it. And now if you have the next picture of Salem, my husband went to Salem, and I went to Bethel. And so, <laughs> well, let's look at the next picture okay, then. I the believe next we have now, is St. No, is Saint you Luke. don't have the other pictures. No, we, we, we had to cut some out for, uh, for time. Well, but this the, is the modern Luke. Salem, is, both of them are still there, mm -hmm. both churches. How are. important, uh, Hester, was, it, or was and is the black church in the community? Well, the black church was not only the social hub of the community, it was also um, an educational hub of the community as, um, well, many activities were conducted at the black churches. Um, in fact, at the same kind of position almost that they still hold mm -hmm. because they are the cohesive 
form mm -hmm. of the black community. Many people who live outside of the black area still go to the black churches. I think uh, another uh, institution I think that's very important, of course, are the schools and uh, moving ahead to, to take a look at, uh, the, I think the first school we want to look at is the Lawhead School. And mm -hmm. uh, that was a neighborhood school. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, these were truly neighborhood schools for the most part. Yes, it was. It was the all black. It went to the third grade. And it, uh, it was the first black teachers were hired for the, the uh, you know, when they, we went before they integrated. Because uh, we went to all white schools but we, we had all white teachers, but we didn't mm -hmm. have uh, any black, you know, any black teachers. Uh, Hester, you eventually became a teacher and a principal. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the new, in, in the old Booker T. Washington Elementary Magnet School. The one they just At that tore particular down. time. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, how did you feel when they tore that down? Well, I had mixed emotions. I think, you know, <laughs> progress goes, progress is progress. And some of the kind of things the children will be able to be exposed to mm -hmm. are really uh, important and quite germane to the, mm -hmm. to the conditions now. And so I, I'm, I, as I said, I had mixed emotions because if you spend 22 years in a place, you certainly do feel as if, um, you know, that's a part of your upbringing and they are a part of your heritage and, and you know you feel a little bit down when it's torn down. Sure. Let's take a look inside Gregory School which was another of the uh, the neighborhood schools and this was a, an integrated school. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. White students and black students well, stayed together. The student, that, that's the school we went to. In fact. But it didn't look like that when we went you know that's a little bit before our age. Mm -hmm. Well I don't know, it looked kind of like that when I went there. <laughs> <laughs> I used to spend more time behind Mrs. Withers' desk than anybody. Let's <laughs> now the, uh, mm. uh, the, let's look at the next image that we have, which is uh, a little bit more contemporary. It's probably in uh, the yeah. 70s, and yeah. by this time they had started to, to integrate, to, to integrate mm -hmm. and bus students around town. Mm -hmm. The one of the interesting things about education, we go to the University of Illinois. Let's go to the next picture because I find this story to be really fascinating. This mm -hmm. is a man by the name of Albert Lee. What can you tell us about Albert Lee? Albert Lee is an icon as far as we're concerned. He was the, uh, the secretary to the president of the University of Illinois. And uh, he was the one that formed the fraternities and he found places for the boys to live because we weren't allowed to live on campus. Uh, the boy, the, when the kids came to school, we had to provide a, a place for them to stay in the homes. And he would contact the different homeowners and people out in town. And uh, where I lived, there was two or three kids that stayed there that went through school there. Um, of course, our family was just a big family, and since my, you know. Uh, my aunt Sadie graduated from there, and Frank was killed. He was from there, but Albert R. Lee was—he formed the Baraka clubs. He formed the—he kept our churches moving. He brought the students off the campus into town. He found jobs for them, and he encouraged them to stay in school. A lot of uh, the the guys that had supreme life in Chicago and around—they all went to school here. He uh, was also, was he the first black employee of the University of Illinois? He was the Illinois? only black employee at, 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 in that capa in any capacity. Let's look at the outside uh, of a mail pair carrier or something okay. like that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, uh, the documentation that came with that. The story was was very very interesting. Another uh, aspect that we want to get into while we have time is the business community. There was a very distinct black. Uh, black a business community. We'll take a look at the next image. Uh, this is uh, actually, if you time liquors, liquors. There. This is a later story. And later. That, that's actually that the, the, old cattle that's the, the cattle, old bank cattle bank building. Bank. Yeah. So if it was cattle bank, and then it became Heinlickers, liquors. It was Heinlickers liquors a long time. And you look down First Street mm -hmm. there to uh, right uh, 
Chuck and Dean and, and uh, some others. Let's look at the next of the business images that we oh, have. they had some others. Uh, I didn't have one, but uh, I had one of Homer Chavis's cleaners out mm -hmm. on Green Street. It, th this is some more along First Street, I believe. Yeah. And but there were uh, uh, there was a, an African American business district along First Street. There was you uh, mentioned Poplar Street as well. Poplar Street was where they had the hotel, the Columbia Hotel, and then uh, the Mrs. Uh, Win Winfield. Yes, Mrs. Winfield. They had taverns. They had the Top Hat. They had different eating restaurants and. A lot of places to go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at the next photo, which I think might surprise a few people. Here is an aerial photo, and if you look, this is the old train station at mm -hmm. the, the bottom of the picture. Look across the tracks, and that is the right in the center. The long building is a livery, mm -hmm. but that's the location now of a, a city parking lot and, of course, the police department. And you have to look back a ways to find First Street, but that street there just to the uh, uh, the left of the livery is what it's Main Street which really doesn't exist anymore except no. for the pedestrian underpass. Well there. also yeah. if you look notice in that particular photograph the trains the train cars they, that are there um, mm -hmm. so, so the box cars. So the, the freight mm -hmm. cars yeah. The freight cars yeah. went on both sides of the tracks. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, for those who can orient themselves where the police station is now, an entirely different look at the city and a very vibrant business district at mm -hmm. the time. But the old commercial bank was there. I mean, they, had, they had other businesses before this was torn down because old commercial bank was there on University mm -hmm. Avenue. Yes, it was. Let's take a look at the, the next image. Oh. This is the, one of the barber shops. Yeah, that's my husband's barber shop. Well, actually, his uncle started the barber shop back, oh goodness, about 1919 or 1920. And then he took it up and then he became a post office and we sold it. But that was the barber. Barbering was a big business in Champaign. Barbering and, hair, and we had hairdressers. We had our own businesses, really. Mm. Uh, so. Let's take a look at the next <laughs> image that we have, which is uh, kind of a fun one. It's the, the price <laughs> list for the, the barber shop, and you see a, a massage at 50 cents and a shampoo at 50 cents and shave at 35. And uh, oh, the prices were high there, and they were at 10 cents at one point. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, of course, the, there were the black businesses, but what was the relationship with the other businesses in town? Oh, well, at one time, uh, the Fred's Barber Shop, before the 99th Pursuit Squadron came to town and before they, you know, before they, the boys came up for them and they opened that, it was all white. Most of the black barber shops cut nothing but white hair. They only had white patrons. But then, after those boys came up on the trains, you know, when they, when they would come into town from Chanute and want their hair cut, and my husband told his grandfather, he said, his uncle that he was working with, he said, look, you're going to have to let me um, <laughs> cut, uh, cut hair in the daytime because I'm not telling them to come back after dark. <laughs> and, it, of course, his uncle looked like he was real light and whatnot, all of them, you know, the whole family, they were from Greenville and whatnot. But they were hunters, and they used to have hunting club. you know, they had the farmers and whatnot came in. A lot of people knew them. But we had a few black barber shops, but only two or three. And then when Fred opened, Fred took over the shop, he opened it up all together. Then he had to train his uncle and them how to cut black hair because they didn't know how to cut it. They had come from Greenville and whatnot, mm -hmm. where most of them had had all white patrons. Let's take a look at this next picture. And this is a woman that many people might ah, know. Ah, that's Lucy. Lucy Gray, who uh, ran an antique, very elegant woman, ran an antique shop when, in what was uh, the JBJ's building until fairly recently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, 
We don't have a lot of time left, but we, we would be remiss if we didn't at least get into the 1960s because uh, of turmoil around the country. We'll look at the next image. Uh, yeah. uh, and of course in Champaign-Urbana as well uh, with part of the civil rights uh, movement. Uh, this is a protester outside of the J.C. Penney store in mm. uh, downtown, downtown Champaign. Champaign. And we'll look at the next image, which was a, uh, a protest uh, on the quad That's on, on campus. the quad on campus, yeah. Well, we had quite a few protests. Uh, uh, a lot of things went on then. At, at, uh, that's when the 500 was first came here. So the, the Project 500, which we discussed in a, a previous episode uh, relative yeah. to the University of Illinois, where uh, space was made in the program for 500 uh, African-American students to come and enroll. Yeah, that's true. And then, of course, we had the, the what, the uproar and the riots. They call it riots, but I guess it was just, but I would have felt bad, too, if I didn't have any place to stay after they <laughs> invited me here to go to school and then tell me that uh, you have to find some place to stay. Well, that had to stop. Well, thank both of you for being here tonight. <laughs> We've really enjoyed it, and the time has gone very, very quickly for us. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. <laughs> Our thanks to Estella Merrifield and Hester Suggs for their insight on the history of African Americans in the city of Champaign. As we continue to look at our 150 years of Champaign history, join us next time for a look at sports in Champaign. From legendary high school teams and coaches to the University of Illinois, to more than our fair share of Olympians and Paralympians, Champaign's athletic tradition runs deep. So join us for the next episode of Illinois Pioneers. Until next time, I'm Rick Atterbury. Thanks for watching.